Welcome to the Manhattan Institute's discussion about anti-Israel extremism and the role of information in the Israel-Hamas war. I'm Brian Anderson, the editor of City Journal, and I'm glad you've joined us today. As I'm sure our viewers know, earlier this month, the Iran-sponsored terrorist group Hamas breached Israel's border with Gaza, brutally murdering over 1,000 Israeli citizens and capturing uh, nearly 200 more. In response to the surprise attack, Israel's pres or Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu declared war on Hamas. I'm joined today by three writers who offer valuable perspectives on the conflict. Yael Bartur is a digital strategist who previously served as the director of social media and digital strategy for the New York City Police Department. Uh, she also served in the Israel Defense Forces as a foreign press liaison. Tal Fortgang is an adjunct fellow at the Manhattan Institute whose work on religion, politics, and culture has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, National Review, Commentary, and City Journal. Uh, Martin Gurry is a visiting research fellow at the Mercatus Center, a former CIA analyst and a frequent City Journal contributor. He's the author of The Revolt of the Public and the Crisis of Authority in the New Millennium. Thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, if our viewers would like to ask the guests a question, the best way to do that is to register for the event and uh, watch it via this Slido platform. Uh, we'll leave a link to it at the top of the YouTube description and you can put your questions in there uh, and you can send them as we go along. So Martin, let me start with you. Uh, the Hamas attack caught everyone, it seems, by surprise. It's clear, certainly, that Israel, which has been living with the Hamas presence on its border since 2007, and the United States, which, which of course, exerts uh, influence on Israeli policy, overestimated both the restraint and maybe even the rationality of this group governing the Gaza Strip. So, so what, in your view, allowed these illusions uh, to survive for so long? And um, does this help explain Israel's failure to anticipate the attack? You know, was this an intelligence breakdown? Uh, was it technological overconfidence in systems like Iron Dome or the Iron Wall or something else? Well, honestly, in, in my experience, um, the Israelis are the best at what they do. Uh, so I, I, I am very surprised that this happened. And I have to believe, uh, uh, as I wrote uh, in City Journal, that there has been, Israel has been so prosperous and it's been so normalized uh, that I think there was a sense that this sort of horror was uh, not possible, uh, that they were that they were set up such that they could catch anything that happened and nothing was liable to happen at this scale because nobody was interested in doing it anymore except maybe the Iranians and they were far enough away. So um, I... I you know, there's a whole lot of hostility, as I understand it now, towards Netanyahu, who was sitting there while it was happening. Uh, and that's probably rightfully so. But um, uh, it, it, it's interesting to me that people who are the smartest at both intelligence and military intelligence uh, in the world, in my opinion, um, essentially got caught looking the wrong way. Uh, and and I, I have no explanation other than they... they um, they lost the sense that if you are a Jew, you are never normal. There's always somebody trying to do horrible things to you. And, and I think that that um, that ex ex incursion of, of Hamas should demonstrate that uh, forever, I would think. And this also, though, seems to be a failure of uh, U.S. intelligence because there, there didn't seem to be much uh, uh, of a sense that this was a possibility on that end as well. Yeah, well, my, my take is if the Israelis didn't catch it, we weren't going to catch it because they're better than we are. Uh, Yael, since the outbreak of the war, uh, social media has proved, I think, uh, a key vehicle for publicizing realities of the Israeli-Palestinian situation that uh, the, the press, I think, has often been reluctant to portray, honestly. Mm -hmm. So from photographs of horrific killings at the Nova Music Festival, uh, to videos of kidnappings of, of Israeli women as their captors are laughing, laughing and celebrating. Um, you know, these are very grim images, but social media 
have exposed a side of Hamas that might have been easier to downplay in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I wonder, you know, can you give a description of your sense of how the internet um, uh, has, has worked in documenting this attack? Um, mm -hmm. And what might have been the international narrative, say, 15 years ago? You know, I'm, I'm, of course, we've just seen how the almost the entire international press uh, rushed to blame Israel for an airstrike on a Gaza hospital that apparently was nothing such. So, mm -hmm. so what you know, what in your view has has changed with regard to social media in this conflict, and is it? Yeah. Um, well, I think what's happening here is, is first of all the scale of this attack uh, and. Is unimaginable to us, and it's touched pretty much everyone in, in this country. I'm, I'm in Tel Aviv right now. Uh, we're, we're such a small country of, of 9 million people, so everybody has been affected by this uh, in some way, shape, or form. So the the stories coming out, the narratives are very personal, but they're also very, they're very grassroots. So we're not waiting for some agency to come and tell people what to say, but rather Everybody is telling their story from the ground up, sharing photos, sharing uh, testimonies, um, you know, sharing stories about loved ones or people they lost. So you have a lot of, uh, you know, material, so to speak, coming out and, and flooding social media by the Israelis themselves that feel very, very strongly about telling the world what what is going on here and making sure that people understand that this is something that not only caught us by surprise, but is terrifying, frankly, and should terrify the Western world. So you, you see a lot of that information coming out from, from people, uh, regular people. And I'm in like five WhatsApp groups of people who are just sharing photos. Here's a story, here's somebody to interview. Um, the whole country seems to have, you know, a real interest now in, in telling people what it, what is going on here and flooding social media. Um, when it comes to the hospital uh, that you mentioned um, y yesterday, um, that you know Al Jazeera came out, and of course the narrative uh, was, of course, immediately that is within 30 seconds the Hamas uh, Ministry of Health, which is you know a terrorist, de facto a terrorist communications arm, um, but within 30 seconds uh, had already said that it was Israel and that 500 people were killed. Um, and the IDF, of course, you know, can never, um, you know, has to go through the information, has to verify things. We can never, we are never able to verify things as quickly as a terrorist organization is able to lie about them. Uh, but, you know, given that, given the amount of time it takes to verify, I think the IDF did come out uh, within a few hours and really call out the international media with proof uh, of their mistake. And I'm hoping, maybe maybe I'm a little naive, but since there was so much proof, there was video evidence as well as audio evidence of Hamas operatives talking about the attack, um, hoping that it is a wake up call for uh, perhaps people in the media um, who tend to take you know, the narrative of a terrorist organization and narrative of a democratic country with checks and balances and kind of hold them next to each other equally. Um, so, you know, that, that specific incident, I'm hoping will be able to show, uh, people at very, very least show people in the media that not, you know, both sides don't have, uh, let's say an equal attachment to the truth. Uh, Tal, um, the mainstream national conversation in the U S has been, uh, frustrating. I think, um, you know, left-wing intellectuals have tried to label Hamas a far-right organization, uh, which New York Magazine called them. Um, and, you know, other publications like Dissent have, have declared that Israel was preparing to commit genocide. Uh, you know, these are just two of numerous examples. I, I think it's, it's fair to say that most Americans are still supportive of Israel, but public opinion, especially among younger people, is trend, trending pretty strongly in an anti-Israel direction. So, so what in your view explains this? Because it is a pretty significant shift. Yeah, I think there's really um, one big idea that has animated the intellectual classes in the West and particularly in the Anglosphere in the past few years. Uh, and that is the wholesale replacement of an idea of uh, morality with uh, analyses of power, 
such that a powerful entity like Israel is relative to Hamas and Gaza just cannot as a matter of, uh, of, of presumption. It, it cannot be the more moral actor. Um, and by the same token, an oppressed group, uh, a subaltern group to use some of the intellectual lingo, by default and, and as an irrebuttable presumption is licensed to do whatever they need to do to rid themselves of the chain uh, of, of oppression. Uh, so when Israel is doing what to uh, someone analyzing the situation under a moral framework, when Israel is doing things that are like obviously justified, defending the very basics of their, their sovereignty, defending Israeli citizens, uh, that gets filtered through this new analytical lens of power which translates uh, moral behavior into unconscionable evil. Um, I think that's really the, the idea that drives everything. There are deeper questions we can ask and we can probe about why it is that this one big idea has taken root, uh, what it is that people find so appealing about it, and what's really going on beneath the surface. But I think simply in order to understand how the, the intellectual classes have convinced themselves that up is down and, and right is wrong and you know everything is, uh, is backwards, I, I think that has the most explanatory power of anything. Uh, you know, just as a follow-up to that, um, anti-Semitic violence in the U.S. Has, has been on the rise in recent years. Uh, you know, uh, given what you've just said, do you, do you see this as... as uh, linked to these radical theories, and and is it an elite-driven phenomenon primarily? I don't know that it's elite-driven primarily. I will say that it is often uh, waved aside or minimized by elites, depending on who is doing the anti-Semitism. Uh, you can ask any American Jew, and, and, uh, and they will tell you without hesitation, that they've encountered all different kinds of anti-Semitism in their life. When I lived in, in New York, uh, I'd get one kind of anti-Semitism on the subway and then another kind of anti-Semitism at my, my destination at New York University School of Law. Uh, they, they sounded in some of the same themes, but they were coming from different places. And depending on the identity of the people doing the anti-Semitism, uh, elites react vastly differently. So when it's the kind of um, anti-Semitism as uh, Arab liberation, which is what I would get at, at NYU, that's the kind of thing that's like, well, Jews are powerful. So, you know, really, are you, are you really a victim here or are you actually just siding with the oppressor? Um, when it comes from, from people on the subway, it's, well, the people on the subway don't really, like, they might be able to stab you, but they don't have institutional systemic power. So, you know, really how big of a problem can that be? But in, uh, in case of a different kind of anti-Semitism, of, of white supremacist anti-Semitism, when a, a, a maniac white supremacist comes into a, a synagogue in Pittsburgh and kills Jews, that all of a sudden becomes the anti-Semitism that's worth focusing on. Um, because it comes from a group that is perceived as being more powerful and, and is perpetrated against a group that is relatively less powerful. So we see exactly how Jews fit into the hierarchy through uh, the, the way that elite institutions and individuals process these events. It's rather transparent. Uh, it's really not very intellectually sophisticated. Thank you. Um, Martin, uh... Shifting back to Israel, before the war, the country was deeply divided politically. Um, judicial reform supported by Prime Minister Netanyahu's religious coalition allies, um, you know, had sparked protests from the nation's more secular business class, I think uh, it would be one way to describe it. Uh, Netanyahu himself is a controversial figure. He served several terms as prime minister, of course, but he's he's facing mounting legal and political pressure in recent years. You know, all, for for now, all of this is is on hold as he leads a wartime government uh, that includes major op opposition figures in key positions. But but do you think it's fair to say that domestic politics can form a, a sort of strategic vulnerability? And what might the future of Israeli politics look like in a country where many citizens, um, including, according to early polling, 
voters in his own party appear to hold the prime minister uh, at least partly responsible for not preventing these attacks. Yeah, a real clear symptom that the Israelis felt that being Jewish had been normalized was that they were indulging the same sort of um, uh, mad, the political madness that we have engaged here in the U.S. under much safer and, and uh, much more protected uh, conditions. So the whole fuss around uh, the Supreme Court in Israel that, that put the focus on Netanyahu, um, where, for example, reservists would say that they would refuse uh, to show up if called, I that kind of set me back a bit. I, I, I wondered, I, I haven't been to Israel in, in many years, uh, but I, I what that should always feel under existential threat can make those kinds of, um, even as a, as a political posture, uh, 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 something that, that you want to proclaim about about your stand, that, that you're not going to show up uh, for, for the reserves. So, um, I don't know what's going to happen. I think that Netanyahu, if, if all those polls are right, is finished. Uh, interestingly, way back when, when um, um, uh, labor was caught in more or less the same fix, um, and and um, was surprised by by an Egyptian and Syrian invasion of of Israel, uh, that that began a, a, a secular shift in in Israeli politics towards the right. I don't know whether the left will profit from this or the far right will profit from this. I have no idea. But it's it's uh, entirely possible that whoever can um, can claim uh, that they will protect the country from these horrors that they have just endured in in a, in a way that's that's believable will will get a political upper hand. Uh, yeah, I, I, maybe I'd like you to respond. It's a two-part sure. question for you. Um, you know, as you noted, you're you're in Israel right now. Uh, clearly, the country is unified in justified anger over uh, the Hamas atrocities. Yet, uh, I think it's true too, as as Martin was just saying, that that many Israelis uh, are um, seeing Netanyahu as at least partially to blame for the situation, mm -hmm. security breakdown. So, how do you see things from Israel on the ground there uh, in terms of this tension playing out? And then to get back to the information warfare question, you know, this this kind of battle in the digital age is is uh, increasingly a crucial operational space. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in in a military context, social media uh, can be a tool to build morale on your own side, uh, or to demoralize or confuse your opponent. Um, you know, the Israel Defense Forces is is very active on social media. Uh, it's tried to demonstrate uh, it's the precision of its airstrikes, for example. Mm -hmm. um, Hamas's information strategy, on the other hand, uh, you know, has been to locate its military headquarters in civilian areas uh, like hospitals and mosques, uh, using them in effect as civilian shields. Mm -hmm. And then, if non-combatants get killed in military exchanges uh, provoke global condemnation of Israel and Israeli war tactics. Mm -hmm. So so that would be my second question. Is there an effective way to counteract this strategy? And you were starting to talk about that a bit, I think, in your first response. But first, to to Martin's point about, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what is what is the situation on the ground there? Yeah, uh, well, I, I think it's it's pretty incredible. Um, if Hamas's goal was to expose the weaknesses in Israeli society, uh, they've really done the opposite. They've, they've really managed to unify people and show that we are so much stronger than even we, we gave ourselves credit for. Because, you know, the last 10 months in this country have been, at least in my lifetime, uh, the most divided I've seen here between left and right, secular and religious. Um, you know, it, it's been very, very difficult. But what we saw happen on the very first day from the people in the field saving lives, giving their lives for strangers that they didn't know, and up until you know all of us here who were volunteering and doing things, there's really not a pair of, of idle hands in the country right now. You see that everybody has come together to support um, this war effort and to look out for each other and protect each other. Um, and you know, it's not because uh, we're, you know, all get along so great. It's not that we're not going to, 
you know, wait till the day after the war to continue fighting again. But it's really the sense of unity that comes from necessity, that comes from this idea of an existential threat, that comes from the idea that I know that I could be in this position tomorrow. So you've really seen people come together, the the reservists and all the people who who stopped going to reserve duty and um, the military um, um, reservists who led, a lot of them led these um, these protests against, Netany- against Netanyahu, they said, okay, stop. We'll pick this up when we're done. And they've really converted all of their efforts, all of their networks, all of their people into supporting the efforts of, you know, uh, bringing people from the South and making sure they have homes, supporting the soldiers in the field. Um, so I think in that sense, Hamas really achieved the the exact opposite. It's managed to unify everybody and and realize that, you know, this, this is what we're good at. This is what we excel at. We know how to hunker down and, you know, look out for each other. Now, I, I've been consuming the Israeli media all the time and talking to everybody. And, and the, the first day or two, everybody was shocked that this happened you know like like martin said we're, we're all how, how did we miss this but i think there's been a bit of a conscious decision to say okay you know we'll deal with that that there will be accountability there will be a day after uh people will pay the price but not right now right now we really need to focus on what's ahead of us how do we bring the, back these hostages i think um last they said it's i think 203 hostages ages eight months to 84 uh, how do we bring back these hostages? How do we support our soldiers that are fighting on both the, both the northern and southern fronts? How do we support thousands of people who had to leave their homes uh, because where they live is not safe anymore? And how do we protect ourselves? Uh, we'll go back to fighting when that's done with each other. Um, as for the you know the social media part, um, you know it's it's interesting. We're we're never going to have the um, the, the speed of a terrorist organization, right? As a democracy, as a country that needs to put out verified information, uh, official information, uh, we're never going to beat them uh, when it comes to speed and when it comes to lying, right? I, I happen to serve in the IDF spokesperson unit. Um, you can say a lot of things about their efficiency, but they don't just make things up or just you know lie about things because we we know we have a very robust media we have a very robust civil society and we're we're a democracy so in that sense you know we're always going to be as a strong and more organized uh side of this conflict where we're always going to have that disadvantage quote unquote uh but i think like i said you know at the end of the day we it sounds kind of funny for me as a social media expert to say it but we have to keep our eye on social media, but we also have to keep our eye on other things as well, on diplomatic relationships, on relationship with the institutions. Um, social media and messaging is part of the game, but um, you know we've seen over the last few days how important the diplomatic relationships are with the United States, with Great Britain, uh, with you know European nations who have who have come uh, forward to support Israel. So we can't lose track of you know aside from the messaging that's supposed to hit the masses, the, uh, the back channel uh, diplomacy. Thanks, Tal. Um, in the uh, aftermath of the attacks, uh, to get back to the US campus, college students, um, many campuses declared support for the group, almost you know, simultaneous with the attacks, which was, was to me very, very disturbing. Um, you know, in many cases, explicitly condoning the atrocities as justified. Uh, many universities had anti-Israel rallies. At Harvard, uh, notoriously now, more than 30 student groups signed a letter holding Israel entirely responsible for Hamas's uh, murder, you know, rape, mutilation, kidnapping of its citizens. Um, and, you know, Harvard, though, wasn't alone. You had NYU, you had the University of Washington, uh, University of Chicago, Columbia University, a uh, similar similar kind of uh, protests going on at all at all of these places. Um, and then you had the university presidents at many of these schools, um, you know, who not so long ago were were gravely condemning police departments across the United States and they were attacking foes of term, affirmative action, issuing political statements constantly, uh, offering, you know, very, very mild disavowals of violence on all sides. So, you know, what, 
what must it be like in your view to be a Jewish student on some of these campuses right now? What were the presidents thinking? Um, and, you know, are we going to see uh, a significant pushback? We've certainly seen the beginnings of it because some of, some of these uh, um, presidents have started to walk back their initially weak comments. Yeah, I don't really have to imagine what it was like what, or what it must be like for Jewish students on a lot of these campuses because I was a law student uh, at, at NYU last year when gunmen on the streets of Tel Aviv killed Israeli civilians while they were drinking beer uh, on, on a, a regular weeknight. Not a military operation, nothing like that, just a straight up terrorist attack. And my classmates celebrated. They celebrated openly on social media. They celebrated with posters in school. Uh, there was no hiding that they thought that this was not just uh, a, a regrettable part of a cycle of violence. It was something worth celebrating. It was uh, bringing attention. This is, it's sort of a, it brings back mid to late 20th century tropes about like, why you would commit terrorist attacks. It brings attention to a cause. You have to capture the world's attention somehow. And I think that explains a lot of these uh, demonstrations that we've seen, which I, I, I've seen and heard them called protests, but that's not a very apt term because they're not protesting anything. They're not, they, they sprang up, these statements and demonstrations sprang up before Israel began responding to the most heinous uh, attack that has ever been committed uh, in, in Israel. Uh, they sprung up as uh, organic responses, celebrations, uh, statements of support for what had gone on uh, because they believe that it brings necessary attention to uh, the cause of liberation. Uh, is the dam starting to break? I think it might be. Uh, I think decent people around the country still recognize that this is I, I, this is insane. This is like moral backwardness. It is, if our universities are not just producing uh, a few crazy students who believe these things, who go out and shout them publicly, but are staffed by administrations that can't uh, work up the the, gall, the, the, the courage to, uh, to say, we've seen the face of evil. And this was like lab made to be the most evil thing possible. Uh, and they can't possibly find it within themselves to condemn it. They've so intellectualized uh, and... and uh, abstracted the the issue that it's become just like, well, what should the highest marginal tax rate be? And like, how many, uh, you know, how many Jews can die? That, right. Those are just kind of like open political questions upon which reasonable people of goodwill can disagree. I think some donors, particularly donors to the University of Pennsylvania uh, or former donors uh, at this point have, have started to recognize that. And uh, what, I, what I think is, is still lacking is the push to see these universities thoroughly revamp their operations, not just issue slightly better statements that display uh, a little bit more moral clarity, because you know that beneath the surface, there are all these people just trying to uh, cover their, their liability, so to speak. Um, and you can call for university presidents to be fired, but there are a million new uh, morally bankrupt administrators in waiting, ready to take their place. Uh, there's something deeply, deeply rotten in the academy, and that needs to be addressed. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about this later on. Uh, there are stakeholders who can who can push for that to be addressed, uh, but we need to see the issue clearly, and that's a deep moral rot. It's not a surface issue. Um, uh, Martin, uh you know, perhaps carrying further reaching implications for American foreign policy and global stability is uh, something you noted in your piece, the role of Iran in these attacks and American attitudes toward Iran. Um, you know, Iran funds and supports various terror groups across the region, including Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, uh, yet the Biden administration, like the Obama administration before it, has courted Iran as a regional partner and uh, unblocked billions of dollars in cash for it to access quite recently. 
The Wall Street Journal reported, however, that immediately after the attacks, uh, the, the journal reported this, Iran had played an active role in uh, planning them. Uh, U.S. intelligence uh, sources are reportedly denying that that's true. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, we're not sure whether that's true or not, but I, I think you could at least say that the Iranians were uh, aware of what was going to happen. And now you have Hezbollah maybe threatening to open a second front uh, in Israel. Are the Democrats in the U.S. going to finally scale back their um, ambitions to be friends with Iran? Now, and might might these events just force their hand uh, if if this continues to escalate? Well, that would mean that the um, the Obama Biden um, organization, I guess you might call it, is a learning organism. And I'm not at all, at all sure that that's the case. Okay, um, I. Uh, you go back to um, the Obama speech that he gave at the Al-Azhar University in Cairo very early in his very first term, and everything that has happened in the last, I would say, I don't know, like uh, 12 of the last 15 years or something like that, uh, you can see the, 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 the model right there. Uh, it's a, um, a foreign policy that essentially there's a new beginning. We're in a new world in which national interests are, are not, not to be pursued. We, sh we work on shared interests. It's a rules-based world order. Um, and what that ends up meaning, of course, is that in the old world, those who are our allies um, are tainted. Uh, and of course, there is no more tainted ally than Israel. And those who were our enemies even if they don't have the same kind of democratic lifestyle we have, they're to be admired and should be approached for, for some sort of uh, compromise. And of course, there's no more uh, anti-American uh, virtue uh, than, than that shown by the Atollas. So the entire focus of the, the Obama-Biden uh, foreign policy has been to somehow create out of this regime in, in, in Tehran a pillar of stability in the greater Middle East. Uh, of course, it's, it's gone dreadfully wrong many times, but I, I'm not really sure that, that that's ever going to end. I, that I have yet to see in either the Obama years or the Biden years, them, you know, the, the, the administrations gathering together, looking at the reality of the case and saying, I guess we got this one wrong. They just don't think in those terms. They think that they basically, if they say different words, if they, if they are uh, apologetic to a higher degree, if they release more money, uh, somehow or another, they can, they can strike that bargain. Uh, yeah, Yale, um, uh, you know, one subtext, uh, of course, of the social media landscape is Elon Musk's uh, ownership of, of X, uh, formerly Twitter. Since he's bought the company earlier this year, he's he's shifted the uh, website's content moderation policies in a, a much more vigorously free speech direction, and and has come under fire for that. Um, you know, in general, he, though, I, I, he's less likely, or the platform is less likely to censor views that progressives uh, deem offensive, which have been going on. Uh, mm -hmm. Instead, X is using community notes. Uh, as a feature to provide context for incomplete information. Uh, so, uh, you know, in your view, to the extent that X has been uh, certainly a vector over the last, uh, you know, 10, 11 days for exposing the brutality of Hamas and these terrorist attacks, uh, what's your view of, of X as, as a platform now? Do you think this has made a difference uh, mm -hmm. in, in the current conflict? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the jury is still out about the the effectiveness of, of Musk's changes. I think in this particular case, um, it was incredibly useful to be able to put out um, some of these videos, some of them that are more graphic. Um, for example, I had put out videos. I had put out a video by CNN. Um, so, you know, not a, not a snuff film that was removed from the meta uh, network because you know it gets caught up in the algorithm that catches something that might be a little gory. So I think in this case, it was very helpful, uh, these changes to uh, bring out all the information. Um, you know, the, the issue of, of anti-Semitism on X is kind of funny for people like me who 
who tend to be more concerned about the the anti-Semitism that is masked as anti-Zionism or anti-Israel, because that's always been on the platform. Um, nothing has changed. I don't think that's increased or de decreased. Um, so, you know, I, I don't necessarily feel it any more or any less, but, uh, but I think in just in terms of the, the videos and the images that uh, we can upload right now that are, are not, um, you know, pleasant to watch. Um, I think a lot of them probably would have been caught up in, in filters, um, you know, pre, pre Musk. And then uh, the community notes have been incredibly helpful for the most part as well. Um, uh, Tal, you were starting to talk about this uh, and, and I'd like to return to it. Um, you know, perhaps in this case, higher education may have crossed a line in the United States and that we're going to see significant change. Uh, corporate leaders, major donors to universities, uh, you know, they've long turned a blind eye uh, to the kind of radical insanity that's gone on in, you know, in the universities. Uh, but this time, you know, and it's a growing number, they're holding students and uh, certainly administrators accountable for their their uh, positions here. Um, so you have prestigious firms announcing they will not hire students uh, who have declared support for Hamas. I'm not sure that will stick, but we'll see. Uh, but you certainly have a lot of major donors now saying they're not going to give another penny to, to these elite schools uh, in response to their unwillingness to... Uh, denounce the attacks. So, so I wonder, you know, could this be a turning point to push the universities in a saner direction? I think so. I think that there is an opportunity for people who can exercise leverage over uh, the way university, the, the, the centers of power in universities. Uh, there's a way to, to point out that what has characterized universities over the last several decades that, uh, frankly, conservatives uh, and, and many Zionists have, have been pointing out and have largely been called conspiracy theorists or worse, uh, is that there, there's a, the, the, the very ideas that have justified these atrocities, the very absurdities that justify atrocities have been woven into uh, curricula They've been woven into entire fields of study. Uh, they've been woven into the way that uh, the administration runs student events, right? The kinds of concepts that are that are taken for granted, the ways that you are taught to think about uh, ideas as seemingly unrelated as like things like sexual assault, uh, right? You have your freshman year um, anti-sexual assault training, and it's all framed through the lens of power. You have to understand that it's all about power. And, and that on its own doesn't seem like an objectionable frame. It doesn't seem analytically wrong on its face, but it's an example of the way in which universities conduct their affairs through this lens, always through this lens. And, and that's you know entire academic departments um, that, that need to be rethought uh, because they have been propagating the, the few big ideas uh, that just do not have explanatory power for world events, uh, and, and they are not morally justifiable ideas. If this is the best uh, analytical frame you can come up with to understand what's going on in the Middle East, you need a better analytical frame. This is it, this is simply insufficient and leads to abhorrent conclusions. If you're know a theory by its fruits, uh, if it if it leads to people celebrating dead Jewish babies it's gone wrong somewhere. So donors and other stakeholders can push schools to, to really investigate and possibly just, just root out the academic fields that have been overtaken by this kind of thinking. Another, I think, pretty radical but logical approach uh, is to push for investigations of admissions. Uh, how are admissions officers determining who should get into our nation's finest universities, law schools, et cetera, because there are only a couple of possibilities here. Either the universities are ushering in hundreds, if not thousands of students who are susceptible to these 
obviously abhorrent ideas who are quick to jump on the bandwagon of liberation of Palestine by any means necessary, including this. Uh, that's not very good. That that means we should probably reevaluate how we are assessing uh, high school applicants to college, college graduates applying to graduate school, um, see what characteristics we've been selecting for that, that lead to this, or uh, it will lead us to the conclusion that these institutions are actually cultivating this kind of worldview, which is a different and possibly bigger problem. Um, so I think with, with pressure on these specific points, uh, donors and, and other stakeholders can move the needle. This, uh, this answers a question that's come from an audience member who asks, and uh, you, you just basically answered this, how uh, views that are shaped on campus by neo-Marxist decolonial ideologies, this power narrative that you were describing earlier, um, how do you change that academic monoculture? These are at least a couple of pressure points now. Uh, th this audience member says that this uh, is this kind of worldview is particularly prevalent in Middle Eastern studies on campuses. I, I think you would agree with that. And if I if I can add one more point on this, uh, the very assumption that uh, is taken so so for granted in so many of these institutions that that drives a lot of uh, of the justifications for the murder of Jews in Israel is that Israel is a settler colonial state. And if we just interrogate that for a second, uh, we can recognize that there are assumptions baked in, uh, which is that uh, Jews are white. They don't belong. They are not indigenous to, if, if people can be indigenous to a place, uh, which I, I question that, but uh, if people are indigenous to places, then the Jews are not indigenous to the Middle East. They're white European colonizers and interlopers. Now, that is, as far as the Israeli population goes, that's just obviously not true on its face because more than half of the Israeli population is Mizrahi, Sephardic, North African, etc. Fine, leaving all that aside, even if it were just talking about Ashkenazi Jews, this is a form of harassment, of denial that the Jews are the Jews of the ancient world that would not be tolerated with regard to any other group. Imagine students going around to members of a distinct group on campus and saying, you are frauds. You are not who you claim to be. You're posers who are doing this for nefarious purposes. That's unacceptable. Yet it's baked into this very assumption of Israel as a settler colonial state. Uh this is a question also from the audience, and I think I'll, it's really directed at, at both Martin and Yale. Both of you have thought about media uh, quite a bit. The question is, because of the lack of information uh, or truthful information, the slant in uh, mainstream elite outlets, um, you know, what what is the IDF strategy in communicating uh, going forward? As, as the Gaza conflict continues, and what should it be? Are they doing things effectively um, in your sense? Uh, are there things they could be doing better? Um, so first you, Mark, and then, and then Yale. Yeah, I mean, Yale, Yale obviously knows more than I do about this, but um, from the framework of, of the American media, um, I it, it's pretty evident to me that, um, this this incident is like the the most um, anti-internet uh, event you could ever imagine. It, it it should not allow for hot takes. We need to every time a claim is made, we need to take a deep breath, stand back, and and say what actually who said what, to what purpose, and what actually did happen, and how do we know who that it did happen. And instead, of course, we have these wild claims being made by by Hamas. Uh, they they have a playbook. I mean, I the article I, I wrote for you, Brian said there's going to be talk about bombing hospitals. I mean, this is a playbook that goes back uh, as far as I can remember uh, during the War of Terror. Um, and um, my my own, I mean, everybody's sententious. The Israelis. Um, uh, they are they they have a side on this war. They're not they're not Olympian. They're not neutral. But I'll tell you, at the moment, the best information you can get you get from the IDF. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I um, I agree. I think uh, I think the IDF and and that's a unit, um, like I said, that I know very well. Um, but I, I think they're doing an excellent job for the most part. They understand um, the let's say imbalance in you know in the narrative that people always view you know the Palestinians as the underdog and the IDF as you know kind of the the stronger one and and for a lot of people that's enough to make a decision right because there's this maybe this goes back to kind of campus culture and some of the elite media culture is this this combination of being ignorant of the conflict on one hand but also being arrogant enough that you think that you have to say what you think about it and you you think you have to wade into the conversation um, but I think the IDF is is very aware of that. Um, so, you know, constantly putting out messaging, but also trying to um, show th- show people a picture that will uh, appeal to their emotion. And unfortunately, there are so many emotional things coming out of, of the conflict. Um, I don't know if you saw, I'm sure a lot of people saw some of the media, but um, Anderson Cooper um, went out with... Um, you know, his cameraman and uh, filmed and, and his cameraman that's been all over the world in conflict zone actually was 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 uh, retching, it's, was throwing up on on camera uh, because of the sights and smells are so horrifying. So I, I mean, not to not to bring your audience so deep into this, but this is what we're seeing here for the last two weeks and any media on the ground is seeing it as well. And, and you can't sort of hide from it. So I think the IDF has been very, um, let's say forthcoming. First of all, it's not all up to the IDF, right? Because there are so many people and families and hostages that they can do whatever they want. But as far as what's considered access to military, access to closed off military zones, like um, some of the villages that were desecrated, um, the IDF has been taking journalists there and, and allowing access and allowing exposure because, you know, like I said, we, we, we want people to see what we see here. Um, and, and I guess, uh, you know, on a very different level, Yale, your, your experience with the NYPD as director mm-hmm. of social media, the, the police are often in a position of trying to counter a prevailing mm-hmm. narrative in the press, right? Yeah. Uh, is, is there something that, that could be learned from both sides there? Yeah, I, I think there's I think there's a lot of similarities. I think there's a sort of a knee jerk reaction to, uh, you know, assume that there's a, a balance of power or assume that, you know, the person who is, uh, let's say, wearing a uniform is necessarily the, the bad person. Uh, I'll leave it to, to Tal to say how how we got here. But, you know, I, I, I've said in one of the pieces that I recently wrote that, you know, the same people who think that you know, who want to defund the police and think the police in America shouldn't have weapons are also the same people who think that Hamas is, has a fundamental right to, you know, murder babies and the elderly. Um, so there is that that huge uh, disconnect here. Um, but yeah, I think I think for some of it, um, it it's just this sort of uh, ignorance of a conflict, ignorance of a wider uh, understanding of what it means uh, to be in the Middle East, but also when it comes to policing, what it means to provide public safety. Um, And just if you're seeing everything at the tweet level, if you're just seeing everything at the image level of, you know, police officer in front of a man or a soldier in front of a child, uh, you think you have your whole head wrapped around the issue, but you don't. And it's the job of these institutions to continue to provide more context. Uh, Here's another uh, audience question. Um, Why, and this uh, I'll direct it to Tal, um, since it concerns, I think, uh, campus culture. Uh, why have feminists in the West been so quiet about um, the repression of women living in Gaza and the rape and other forms of violence uh, perpetrated against Israeli women in the Hamas attacks? Um, first, uh, do you agree with the, the premise of that question? Have feminists been quiet about this? I, I can't say that I, I know one way or the other on that. Um, but if they have been, why do you think that's the case? From what I've seen, I would say that that's partially true. Um, on, on the part of many feminist groups, I'd say there's been strategic silence, knowing that coming out in favor of the sort of 
party or ideological line would look obviously bad. Um, some some feminist groups have affirmatively come out and said, like, we our issue is the treatment of women and the way that Hamas treated Israeli women is barbaric and evil and expressed uh, all that needed to be expressed uh, with with that statement. And, and that's good and they deserve to be applauded. I think, unfortunately, for the rest, for those, uh, ident- this is true of identity groups beyond feminists, but the question uh, addressed feminist groups. So I- I'll say that, unfortunately, I think the, the conclusion that, that is most reasonable to draw is that <laughs> this is really part of a, of a popular front uh, movement that doesn't quite ha- have so much to do with advancing various uh, oppressed groups' particular interests so much as uh, a cosmic view of all oppressed groups need to be liberated. And so even though there's this really stark disconnect between advocating for uh, women's rights and advocating for uh, LGBT rights and advocating for Hamas, there are obvious discrepancies and, and problems there. Um, there. There's this sort of almost faith-based view that um, liberation for some of us is liberation for all of us. We have to collectively break uh, break the chains of oppression. Um, And so feminism is one sort of identity that gets subsumed uh, into that greater view of liberation. We've seen other forms of this um, sort of sacrifice of the particular cause for the greater movement for liberation on various campuses where um, the the abhorrent statements that we've seen were, were written usually by Students for Justice in Palestine, but lots of identity groups signed on. And uh, it, it, it boggles the mind that all these identity groups were so quick to sign on as if, you know, being a, a South Asian law student or a, a Latino law student has anything to do with with the law students for justice in Palestine, uh, unfortunately, I think we have to conclude that they they do because it's really not quite about the, um, the, the the identity that they represent so much as being um, a, a progressive liberationist institution that is defined by a particular characteristic as regards its members. So, uh, unfortunately, I think the the cynical conclusion is in the in the most instances the, the correct one. Uh, we're, we only have about uh, seven minutes left, so let me ask a question uh, directed at all three of you. Um, you closed your excellent uh, essay for City Journal on on the situation in Israel, uh, Martin, by speculating that ultimately the international reaction to what is sure to be this ongoing um, Israeli response will put the nation in a familiar position of being uh, the scapegoat of the world uh, for, for Israelis to be the scapegoat. Um, you know, I, I wonder uh, for those who don't want to see that happen, what can philanthropists do, policymakers, educational institutions do to counter um, this, this growing anti-Israel extremism that we've been discussing? So starting with you, Martin, Yale, and then we'll conclude with you, Tao. Well, that, that's, that is a long, long question that <laughs> would uh, consume not only the seven minutes, but probably seven hours if I start talking. Um, I think it, it, it goes far beyond uh, anti-Semitism. I think it goes to that, that um, strange established church of identity that, that uh, Tal has talked about, that I tend to view far more simplistically as... Um, uh, the manipulation manipulation of group status by elites in power uh, who get to decide which group is up and which group is down and, and whose ultimate um, goal seems to be to um, undermine everything that has been traditionally believed in terms of morality and politics and so forth. I think the only thing we can do, honestly, it, it, it until we can change that structurally, that that the fact that our, our country is divided politically, but culturally, monolithically, uh, sworn to identity. Uh, until that happens, it's up to every individual to have the courage to say what they think and not to be cowed by um, the fact that you will be 
you will be considered also part of the scapegoat of history if you side with the Jews. You will be considered um, a, a pariah uh, and, and a murderer and so forth uh, because you are with the colonialists, you are with, with uh, the, the whites in the Middle East. In the Middle East. Um, I think there's a lot of, most people who mouth these identity platitudes do not believe in them. I, I, I make it an act of faith that that's even true among young people. I think you just basically have the courage of saying this is this is not something that you can stand a, a fence you can straddle. You have to be on one side or another. You have to be either with the side of the people who want to exterminate every Jew in Israel, or with the people who are trying to prevent another horror, like what happened uh, just recently. You can't just stand in the middle. You can't just judge both sides from some kind of Olympus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh... I, I completely agree with with Martin. I'm uh, part of me hopes that this this will be the kind of the the cracking open and the crumbling of identity politics because if if you look around and you see, for example, you know the feminist organization, the LGBTQ organizations, and all the people who a minute ago told us to believe all women, but now they're actually really don't believe the women that are saying that they were raped and they want proof. What I'm hoping is everybody that's looking at it from from the side uh, will be able to know that it was all uh, it was all not true all along, right? So I, I'm hoping that this will be the 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 match maybe that burns the identity politics for for the rest of us who have been looking from the sidelines and realizing um, that it it just it's just all been meaningless all along, right? If you can't come up uh, in this point of time and 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 um, you know condemn this this brutal act that's so clear cut. Uh, maybe you didn't mean any of the other things you were saying as well, all the land acknowledgements and all the pronouns and everything. Maybe that was all all a show. So I'm hoping this is a wake up call for a lot of people. And, and I do hope people will speak up. I think uh, I do agree that a lot of people are just going along. You know, I, I don't expect people to understand the Middle East conflict. Um, I just expect them to, you know, not necessarily go along with somebody who they don't agree with. So I'm hoping a lot of people, if they do feel in their heart that somebody saying something wrong, not to worry about being impolite or not to worry about being stirring the pot and, and say something because you'll be surprised. They'll have, you'll have a lot of people behind you who might raise their hand too and tell you that they agree with you. Thanks. And Tal, to conclude with you. I endorse uh, Martin's and Yael's comments in full and incorporate them here. I would add that there's a lot of temptation right now. And I'll admit that I, I am partial to this temptation to do everything in my power to use the heavy hand of the state uh, and, and business and every other institution to punish people who I think have views that do not belong uh, in, in polite society, in decent society, in civilization. Um, I, I, I will not disavow that temptation at this point, but I will say that none of that is sustainable without uh, the widespread understanding within American society, within the West, that uh, people who support Hamas really are just as awful, just as evil, ought to be equally pariahs as uh, members of the KKK or any other of the sort of like token hate groups that we use as, as paradigms of being evil. Um, so persuasion, persuasion of regular Americans, getting them to understand the, the toxic and absurd ideas that justify this uh, is, is a an important mission for all of us. Uh, we cannot simply rely on power to to do the work sustainably. And I, I cringe at saying the words do the work, but there is work uh, for, for we regular Americans uh, to do in making sure that uh, the, the people who are uh, cheerleaders for barbarianism uh, do not approach the, the gates of American society. Well, I, I wanted to thank all three of you, Martin Gurry, Yael Baratur, Tal Fortgang for your informed commentary. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in and uh, for the good questions coming from the audience. I, I appreciate your time today. Thank you.